Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Let's Remember Suicoden 3. We have gone through Chris's Chapter 1. We have gone through Ghetto's Chapter 1. We have seen tragedy and politicking and all sorts of stuff, and it's a really interesting game so far. Uh, particularly Chris's chapter gave us a lot to talk about. And now Hugo is going to give us a fair amount to talk about as well, so let's get right to it. Um, before I even talk about Hugo, I just want to note right at the start of these videos uh, right here, um, you've probably been watching them for a while if you've gotten this far, I've been trying to break this up into 30-minute segments, and I hope that's okay. If you would prefer 15 or 10, I can kind of cut them down even further. With Skies of Arcadia, we did it after every major story point, which led to episodes that were about an hour long. And so I wanted to cut them down. Now we're at the half uh, half of that, and I can adjust from there. I know people are busy during their day. If there are shorter uh, ways of going about the video and you would like that, please leave a comment and let me know. Um, so this is Hugo, and Hugo's chapter is really, really cool. And Hugo's chapter opens up uh, with this prologue, as everybody else's prologue does. But Hugo's prologue is this thing that makes a really nice contrast to Chris's prologue, because Hugo starts off in this open area, this colorful grassland, with um, not many people around, right? He's riding on sort of a dark, kind of antelope horse type of care, uh, uh, creature. Um, whereas Chris's opening, it's there's the streets are full, it's very claustrophobic, um, and you know, she's she's in her armor, she's riding down the street, and everything, there's a lot of regalia, right? So there's this big contrast between Chris and Hugo, and we'll talk about it in multiple ways, but just in those two opening prologues, there's a lot of different um, ways in which they contrast. Chris's prologue sets up sort of her identity crisis and sort of anxiety that she feels because of social pressure, and Hugo stresses, like, his freedom and his innocence, which he's going to lose very quickly. Um, so, I, I like that. And you don't really know, though, you don't really notice it until you've played the game at least once, and you see in retrospect what those two prologue openings are doing. And then Ghetto's prologue is sort of the odd man out uh, of the prologues, um, just because Ghetto is also sort of the odd man out of the protagonist, because his background is very, very different than Hugo or Chris's, but we'll learn more about Ghetto later on. I want to stop for two seconds and say that uh, uh, Hugo and the other fellow were talking about uh, Earth Spirits, and this is Sergeant Joe. He is from the Duck Clan. He's super cool. <laughs> Seriously, look at that character portrait. It's pretty badass. And he, he says uh, his clan doesn't believe in those spirits. So the thing I like about the Grasslanders is that it's not just the grasslanders there are multiple tribes with multiple different you know implied beliefs and and cultures and sort of not overly distinct visual aesthetics but but some of them are certainly more distinct than others which stresses that the grasslands is this area comprised of tribes whereas zexin is this really uniform really kind of drab space i mean there's it's certainly more colorful than your standard um, RPG fare that you you might find today, but it's still it's still a lot of you know brick and steel and and it feels very homogenous. Whereas um, right off the start when we got that shot of Hugo and then Sergeant Joe and then uh, the Griffin, who we'll see his name in a minute, um, we get the sense that this is a diverse group of people with all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so we talked about the Griffin for like two seconds. Uh, this is Fubar. Um, I want to stress that again. This is a giant griffin whose name is Fubar. Um, that's amazing. That's super cool, and I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, every game should have a giant griffin named Fubar. Um, it's really great. Um, so Hugo's opening is really relaxed, and it's really great because it it's it's this whole contrast to everything that we've already played um but it's also invoking or evoking rather um certain emotions that we have regarding sort of the start of a traditional jrpg and i'll talk about that in a minute uh because i'm i, I there's so many things for me to talk about with hugo so 
let me start in earnest and let me try and talk about Hugo. And then I'll sort of talk about what is, hap is happening structurally with Hugo's chapter one. Um, so Hugo is incredibly interesting to me because in the context of a JRPG, he is one of the only characters I can think of where he is a protagonist and he is also a member of a native or indigenous group of people. Because, as we've discussed in previous videos, that tends to be the providence of, like, elves or, or, or fantasy groups. But, but Hugo's not a fantasy creature. He's not an elf. He's not some sort of dwarf druid. He's, he's a young kid who just happens to live as part, you know, in a hunter-gatherer sort of subsistence hunting uh, culture. Um, semi-nomadic even um, and the only other character I can think of that is sort of of a native group in a JRPG and it's actually kind of critical to their character is Gallows Carradine of Wild Arms 3 and Gallows is interesting because he's explicitly running away from his heritage he doesn't want anything to do with it Hugo is interesting because he fits right into his heritage, and um, Hugo's comfort is meant to make sure that we empathize with the Karia clans, uh, or the Karia clan, and the rest of the Grasslander clans. Um, we need to see it through his eyes a little bit. Um, we need to see it free a little bit from all the politics that, that come with it for a little bit, for, for us to really grasp how kind of not idyllic but how nice this lifestyle can be with chris we see a lot of the social pressures that are exerted on her uh, whether that's because of her gender or because of her position hugo's only real social pressure that he has is that his mother is um chief of the clan which will tie back into another thing i want to talk about when it comes to how Hugo is structured as a protagonist, like the tropes that he fits into. Uh, but I guess what I'm saying here is that Hugo is of note to me because he is a dark-skinned native character in a JRPG. And not just in a JRPG, in an RPG, that doesn't always happen. They're not always the protagonists either. Um, there are plenty of times where they join your party, but they are not... Hugo is a POV character, and that's significant. And we should never forget uh, that significance when we consider Hugo's place within the game. Okay, so that being said, let's see what else I want to go into. Uh, okay, so Hugo is also doing another thing um, in terms of how he is structured as, as a, an individual. Uh, and to sort of talk about it a little bit, I will um, talk and explore the village a little bit. Uh, when Sergeant Joe laughs, he goes quack, 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 which I love. Um, so, I guess what I'm trying to say... Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's talk about Hugo, how he fits into the series' larger canon. Oh, a cat! I get distracted. Um... Hugo, out of anybody that we control, of any actor that we have access to, represents uh, the stereotypical, or what we will call the stereotypical, um, Suikoden protagonist. Which means that he ticks off a couple of uh, criteria on, uh, on a box, right? He is young. He is... Um, he's a boy. Uh, a young boy um, sort of on the cusp of adulthood um, he is related to somebody of social status that is uh, higher than his peers I just also wanted to stop and say that Isla is in this chapter even though you don't really know how significant Isla is um, if you're just playing Hugo's chapter but because we have the hindsight of playing Ghetto's chapter we can look at Isla and be like oh she's going to have her own journey to go on separate of Hugo, and it really makes the world seem really big. Anyway, what I'm saying about Hugo, he fits into the mold of the traditional Suikoden protagonist. 
Um, so let's compare him to, say, Tyr, the protagonist of the original Suikoden. Tyr is a young boy who is just joining an army regimen. His father is a famous general within the uh, country that he's in. Uh, I forget the name of the country. Um, it eventually gets renamed the Torin Republic, but that's not what it is at the beginning. Um, his father is a general, and he's sort of go going off to... He he's joining like a cadet corps in this. Uh, Hugo is sort of growing up into uh, the warrior mold of his tribe. Um, but it tends to be, you know, young boy thrust into political situation, father figure or mother figure um, of social worth. For instance, in Suicode in four, uh, 5 and in 4. So in Suicode in 5, you play as a prince. The entire story is about you as a prince, and um and your sister's princess obviously father king queen it's this really big deal in sui code in four um it's never explicitly stated but um your character is also a prince uh, he, uh sort of the long lost scion of of a king of these island nations uh so the protagonists in sui code tend to have uh not like political clout that they're like distinctly aware of, but they fit a certain mold. Um, and we'll talk to Jimba in a minute. Or, I guess it's a uh, freaking trigger volume and, and not me talking to him. So we'll talk to Jimba now. So Jimba is also another case of like, here's a character from another story that we know has some sort of significance um, in a couple of ways. Jimba knows Ghetto. They explicitly talk about things, and they're like, we need to talk alone, just you and me. The armor that Jimba is polishing is armor that Chris recognizes as possibly being her father's armor. But these are all things that we never really know unless we've played those chapters beforehand. So now we can play through this chapter with all of these sort of... with the benefit of a lot of hindsight... And I really enjoy that. Um, and Jimba doesn't really tell us how he got the armor. He just says he got it from a past acquaintance. Um, Lulu is Jimba's brother. Uh, Lulu is Hugo's friend. Uh, I'll talk about Lulu maybe later. Um, very happy-go-lucky. Uh, we unfortunately know what happens to Lulu. Um, so I feel like he's a little overstated and tropey. Um, in order to play up the moments when Chris um, kills him. Spoiler alert if you haven't been watching the series. Um, so, oh boy. There's, my mind is scattered, and I wish that I wasn't rambling as much. So what am I trying to get at when I'm talking about Hugo? Is that um, not only is Hugo structured as the traditional Suikoden protagonist, everything about Hugo's chapter one functions and plays into a lot of traditional JRPG tropes, right? Young adventurer, small village, sent out on a task to go to the big world that's outside of the village, ends up getting involved in things beyond his control, um... His home village is burnt down, which is a thing that happens all the time in JRPGs. Um, Hugo's role for a large portion of the game, or at least for this portion and then sort of what follows, is to put a traditional JRPG sort of structure into a more political structured uh, narrative, and then just say like, Here's sort of what happens when this is happening in a more complicated uh, game space, right? So his hometown gets burnt down, and in most JRPGs, that's really simple. We've talked about this before, I think, in Ghetto's chapter. But 
with Hugo, we understand the political context behind it. We understand a lot of these things behind it. And then we get to see, like, the village beforehand and all these other things. And by giving us this sort of traditional experience before it sort of blows up all of the um, the political stuff, it it's like, it basically says, like, here's a normal JRPG for, for Wave. Like, assuming that you play as Hugo first, and when you centered on the wheel, he's probably the first one you're going to select. Um, and and then it just, like, pulls the rug out of underneath all of that. It sets up this traditional structure and then complicates it. And the game cannot work the way it does without Hugo. Ignoring the fact that Chris also needs a contrasting viewpoint that's from the grasslands, Hugo needs to function the way he does and I swear I will select a dialogue choice in a minute. Hugo needs to function the way he does in order for the game to comment partially on JRPG narratives um, to a certain extent. So Lucio wants Hugo to go to uh, the Zexan capital to send a message. So we will say an official message. What is going on? It is the early negotiations towards a peace agreement. The Zexan Council has been informed a messenger will come. The Zexan Capital? Metal Gear? Um, so this is what Hugo is doing on his way when we stumbled into him at the Brass Castle when we were Chris. And he's supposed to talk to the Council, but he's also like, I can... I want to talk to you. You're the leader of the military. I have a message. Um, and then Roland sort of shuts that down. Um, actually, we have to choose all three. That Oh, that's really interesting. This is, this is sort of a dialogue. It's not even really a dialogue tree. It's just like... It's just a list. Um, right? Very strange. I, I haven't really encountered that very often in games. Not recently, anyway. Usually you have a chance to back out, or it's just you choose one or something. That's that's sort of an oddity when it comes to dialogue things. Because, like, here, this is blatantly, like, I choose one or the other. I'm up to it. Because I'm Hugo. It's great. Just like his mother, brave as a jaguar. Um, boy, I'm rambling, but there's so much to talk about um, with Hugo. A lot of what is happening with Hugo's structure, um, with Hugo's narrative, is that it's taking this this notion of like this very simple like you're on an RPG adventure, and then it comes back, <laughs> you come back home, and it's like actually your home was burnt down as a delaying tactic in a larger war because somebody was manipulating peace agreements between two peoples that were having border disputes and uh, have fun your friend has just been killed by another one of the protagonists um it wants to start off with something very simple and it's important too that they do it through the eyes of somebody who is younger who then has to understand that things are not as simple as he thinks they are um right and it ends up being fairly effective or at least i think so um structurally hugo's chapter is actually probably more interesting than chris's in the sense that it is doing more with the form of a jrpg even though chris's chapter might have more politics to it um this has for lack of a better term sort of more meta narrative stuff going on um i'm just looking at uh, jimba one thing hugo lulu learn well what a zexin looks like not every helmet seen from afar is being worn on a zexin head um so jimba's trying to explain to them like they don't really leave the village or the grasslands much so he's like he has to explain to them like hey other people like it's such simple stuff but it's also just like jimba has to explain to him like hey there are other people out there who wear armor other than people from zexan which is jimba's way of sort of being like in an odd way like watch your biases um which which is interesting but makes sense given what we will learn of jimba's background i just want to walk around here i think this is the space yeah um so, like, spaces like this, by the way, give us an understanding of 
the Karya tribe um, beyond sort of what we already understand. We've seen hunters and warriors, but now we see craftsmen, right? And it's important that games give us spaces that show um, artisans and other people as well. Um, that's why I wanted to go in there. So let us head out of the village. Uh, let me try and gather a lot of what I want to say into a little bit of a more cogent state uh, of affairs bef before I really get in, get further into the chapter. Um, so I just, I did that. What did the guy say? Am I repeating it? All right, everybody. Oh, do I need to go to the inn? I can't leave yet. Um, one of these is the inn. Okay, so we have three characters, and together they form a larger narrative that is being told, and each character serves a function. Chris largely serves to tell us about the politics of the world, right? And to sort of stress how complicated things are on a, on a smaller picture between the Zexan and the Grasslanders. And then there's the gender stuff and all the other things that are associated with Chris. Hugo is supposed to take the traditional structure of a JRPG and show us that that structure will not hold in this world if you're unfamiliar with how Suicoden handles things. Ghetto is trickier. Uh, his chapters largely serve to reinforce a broader image of the plot in the sense that there are machinations and things that go even beyond the Zexan Grasslander conflict. But he's also going to be a character whose function will come in handy later on in the game because his function actually will be largely to talk about sort of the metaphysics of the space and like the nature of things like runes and things like that. Um, place your bets. What are your theories about Ghetto? Uh, he seems to know a lot of people. Um, there are reasons for that. So each of the characters are, are doing something. Um, Chris is telling us about the space. Hugo is telling us, uh, like, Chris is telling us about the space on a personal level. Hugo is telling us about the space um, in terms of what it represents, like, compared to other RPGs. And then um, Ghetto is trying to teach us a, a bit more about, like, the wider implications of the space and how those things function. And when you put them all together, not only uh, do you have a complete picture of the game space, but you actually have all of these narratives that have contrasting viewpoints and characters with different um, sort of prejudices and things that come into conflict. But in having all of those different viewpoints, and, and uh, Ghetto isn't as bogged down by prejudice as other folks. Ghetto can sort of move in and out of spaces the way that Hugo or Chris can't, so that's another reason why he's important. Um, but by having all these characters with all of these different viewpoints on sort of the space and each other, we're able to experience each space that we are spending time in in different contexts, and that helps us understand a lot more about about the space. So here, for instance, the only time that we had encountered Lucia before, it was as um, the chief of the Karya clan at a peace summit, or at the negotiation table, and then on the battlefield as somebody who was going to fight off the Zexan alongside uh, the lizard clan. Now we get to see Lucia as a mother. Um, and we get to see Lucia as Hugo's mother, um, you know? Uh, so we get to see all of these spaces in, in all these different contexts. And it's not a question about who's right or who's wrong. It's just a question about who is. Like, who are these people? Why do they behave the ways that they do? Why do they come into conflict the way they do? Um, and the answers are not simple. And in most narratives, in most JRPG narratives, they are simple. Um, for instance, Skies of Arcadia. I love it. 
Skies of Arcadia is not complicated. Um, that lack of complication is one of the things I love about it, but I also love the fact that Suikoden 3, or any game in the series, can sit back and tell you that you are dealing with people of complex political motivations and personal motivations and all other sorts of things. Um, a lot of games get really into their machinations in a way that doesn't feel as personal. Here feels really personal because we're because of the way that we flipped from point of view to point of view. Um, but it's always been a strength of the series, I think, that the highly political nature of the plots um, generally have a, a lot of humanity to them. Um, Jimba gives us something here, by the way, to take to the Lightfellow family in Vinay del Zexe. So, hey, another reason why Hugo might have wanted to talk to Chris. Um, it belonged to a brave Zexan soldier who died long ago. When you give it to his family, tell him that he died heroically. Um, right? So there's this thing here going on with Jimba. Uh, did he kill Chris's dad? What's going on? But also, it's like, Jimba respects the warrior who died bravely, um, which tells us something about the carrier values. Um, anyway, th what I'm trying to say is that uh, some games get really into their machinations and their politics um, in ways that they don't necessarily need to. Like sometimes some games love their lore, right? They really, really love it. Um, Suikoden likes its lore. It, it likes it quite a bit, um, so much so that things persist from game to game to game. Um, and the world grows from title to title. But at the same time, it's not in love with its lore so much that it is um, too complicated. Uh, which sounds like a funny thing to say, but it, there is a place where you get a little too into your own... I guess into your own writing... Um, I wish I could give a really good example of this. Uh, I can't think off the top of my head. Um, look at these things. Purple creepers. We're going to fight them. Um, so you can see Hugo and Sergeant Joe and everybody. Sergeant Joe with his really cool halberd jumping in. Lulu. And Fubar. Oh, Fubar is amazing. But the purple creeper um, apparently can swallow folks whole, which is really scary. But we have Sergeant Joe, who's super strong. Um, I guess what I'm just trying to say is that Suikoden has a respect for its game space as a persistent thing from title to title to title, but doesn't get so bogged down in the structure of its space that it becomes um, incomprehensible or unapproachable. Uh, Another game that actually handles this very well within the context of everything um, is Final Fantasy XII, where there's a lot of this really implied rich history, and the localization of that game is amazing, where it's all uh, given like very proper English and things like that, to, uh, or at least some characters are. Uh, Vaughn is given kind of a low, low birth kind of way of talking. He's more casual, while Barth Balthier or Ash are very formal. Bosch especially, too. Um, but Final Fantasy XII is a game full of political machinations, but um, and also full of plenty of background lore, but you don't need to know a lot of that background lore to understand the interpersonal relationships that are happening between sort of the characters. You understand the, the politicking that's taking place. Uh, this game complicates things a bit by doing the split perspectives, but the series overall handles um, having sort of multi-layered sort of plots that also have a lot of plotting um, and doesn't really, s you know, it, it makes it approachable, which is essential, I think, to having a game like this be successful. Um, if it gets too complicated, it, it just becomes, like, annoying to try and suss out everything that's happening. Uh, 
but a game like this or Final Fantasy XII makes it fairly comprehensible and understandable, and that's great because we can have degrees of nuance that don't isolate or um, sort of disenfranchise the player. I am just going to <laughs> laugh for a minute as I see that animation because that animation is ridiculous. Um, imagine if that happened to you in real life. You're just fighting a thing and it, you shrunk down and it chomped on you for a minute. It'd be scary as hell. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to get us to the Brass Castle and then we will end. Um, I know I've sort of rambled a bit, but um, Hugo's chapter gives me a lot to think about. Like, a lot to think about. And... Um, I am all files with no file cabinets, so ideas just flood into my head. Uh, anyway, that is the end of the first section of Hugo's uh, first chapter, and we will head to Brass Castle next. Thank you all for watching! I love you very much, especially for putting up with my crazy rambling. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day slash night. Bye! <laughs>